Since we have started diving into the world of 3JS, I feel like that is an endless amount of cool things we can build. Being relatively new to this, I want to start with something basic yet uncommon and gradually work our way toward more advanced projects. You have probably come across landing pages with 3D scenes that move or rotate based on mouse movement. It's a widely loved effect that creates an immersive experience. In today's video, we'll create something similar. After a lot of attempts, I put together a 3D landing page featuring a smooth parallax effect. You can see the scene reacts dynamically to cursor movements, making it interactive. To enhance the experience, I have added a preloader and some clean text animations to give it a proper landing page feel. In this video, I'll guide you step by step on how to create this 3D parallax effect using HTML, CSS and 3JS. I have noticed how much you guys liked the last 3D tutorial, so I'll try to keep bringing more exciting 3D projects in the future. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button, it helps me keep creating. And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe for more tutorials. For those who are interested in the source code, you can check out the link in the description. Alright, let's jump right into it. Let's start by discussing the assets. To begin with, you'll need a 3D scene. Since many of us don't have experience with tools like Blender or Cinema 4D, Sketchfab is a great alternative. It offers thousands of free 3D scenes ready to use. I'll include the link to the model I'm using in this video. For this project, I'm using GLTF format. As for the project structure, I created a folder named Assets and placed all the downloaded files inside it. In addition to that, we'll have the usual HTML, CSS and JavaScript files. Make sure to include all the necessary CDNs. Apart from the 3JS, we'll need this post-processing library to achieve the glowing bloom effect using emissive materials. I'll later cover how to use it in this project. Let's start with the HTML structure. First, we need a container to hold our 3D scene. For this, I created an empty div with the class name Corridor. Next, I added a loading screen. A simple div with the class loading to display a message while the model is rendering. For the rest of the page, I added some placeholder content to give it a more complete look. This part is optional if you are focusing solely on the 3D scene. I created a section called Hero that includes a navigation bar. The navbar is divided into three parts. Inside each, I added some placeholder links. Below the navbar, I added an H1 with some sample text to simulate a landing page heading. Finally, at the very bottom, I added a footer with a sample paragraph element. And that's it for the HTML structure. Now let's move on to the styling. First, I'll do a global reset by removing default margins and paddings and setting box sizing to border box. For the HTML and body, I set their width and height to 100% to make sure our layout spans the entire viewport. I will also add a dark background color. The corridor class which holds the 3D scene is positioned absolutely to cover the entire viewport. For the loading screen, I centered the text both vertically and horizontally using fixed position and transform technique. I styled the text in uppercase with a clean font and set the color to white. The H1 element which acts as the main heading is positioned near the bottom left of the screen. It spans 60% of the width, uses uppercase text styling and is styled with a futuristic font. For paragraph and link elements, I kept the styling consistent, uppercase text, a clean monospaced font and white color. Links have no underline to maintain a minimalistic look. The hero section which contains the navbar and the other content is layered on top of the 3D scene using higher Z index. I will also add a mix blend mode set to difference to create a cool blending effect with the scene. The nav is positioned at the top and spans the full width of the viewport. It uses flexbox to align its items in a spaced out layout. For the navigation links, I used a flex container with gaps to create even spacing between them. Lastly, the footer is stuck neatly into the bottom right corner with absolute positioning and some padding for a balanced look. With these styles in place, we now have a minimal and futurist layout to complement our 3D scene. 
let's move on to the javascript part let's start by creating the foundation for our 3d environment we need a scene which acts as the container where all 3d objects lights and cameras will live for the background i have set it to white next we need a camera to view the scene I'm using a perspective camera which mimics how our eyes see the world making the 3D objects look more natural. The camera is configured with a wide field of view and I've matched its aspect ratio to the screen size so it scales properly on any device. Then we set up a renderer. The renderer's job is to take all the objects in our scene, process them and display the result on the screen. I have optimized it for performance by turning off features we don't need like anti-aliasing or depth rendering and set the pixel ratio to ensure it works smoothly on high resolution screens. Finally, I attach the renderer to the corridor div so it displays within the container. Now that we have the basic setup, we need to light up the scene. Lighting is important because it makes the objects visible and adds depth to the environment. So just like the last video, I'll paste some code here but you can ignore this part as it mostly depends on the model you are using. With the lighting in place, we move on to the camera's position. We start by setting some initial variables for controlling the camera's position. The initial angle determines the starting rotation of the camera around the scene and the radius is the distance from the camera to the center of the scene. These values define the circular path the camera will follow. We also set up two sets of variables, current angle and target angle for the camera's rotation and current Y and target Y for its vertical movement. These variables will allow us to smoothly transition the camera's position over time, creating a more natural effect instead of a sudden movement. Next, we position the camera slightly to the side and above the center of the scene, giving it a clear view of the model. The look at function ensures that the camera always stays focused on the center of the scene no matter where it moves. To make the scene interactive, we add parallax control which allows the camera to respond to mouse movements. The goal here is to adjust the camera's angle and height dynamically based on where the cursor is on the screen. We start by calculating the center of the screen using window half x and window half y variables. These values represent the midpoint of the screen in terms of width and height. Then, we add an event listener for the mouse move event. Every time the mouse moves, we calculate how far it is from the screen center in both the horizontal and vertical directions. We subtract the x-coordinate of the mouse from the center of the screen to determine how far left or right the mouse is. This value is then divided by the screen's width to normalize it, giving us range between minus 1 and 1. The result value is used to update the target angle which controls the rotation of the camera around the center. Similarly, we subtract the Y coordinate of the mouse from the center of the screen to measure how far up or down the mouse is. This value is normalized and used to update target Y which controls the vertical position of the camera. The math might seem a bit abstract, but the idea is simple. The farther you move the mouse from the center, the more the camera tilts or moves. Finally, the target angle and target Y are updated dynamically as the mouse moves. These values represent where the camera should move and in the next step, we'll make the camera transition smoothly towards them using animation. Now let's load the 3D model in our scene and customize its materials to make it look visually dynamic and polished. First, we define a set of emissive colors. These are used to make specific parts of the model glow. I just realized the names in my model didn't match perfectly with the categories I had set up for the emissive colors. Apologies for that, I forgot to update the object names from the previous scene I was testing with. So, make sure the names and colors in your 3D model align with the categories we'll define here. A default color is also included as a fallback for the parts that don't match any specific category. To load the model, we use a loader to import the GLTF file from the assets folder. This loader reads the 3D scene and brings it into our project. Once the model is loaded, we go through each part of it, examining its objects, meshes and materials. 
if it's a mesh a renderable object we enable shadow casting and receiving to make it interact with light realistically this adds depth and detail to the scene if the part is a material we check its name to see if it matches any of the categories we defined for emissive colors when a match is found we apply the corresponding glow if no match is found the default color is used you can also ignore this part i guess it won't make much difference in the scene we are using it was for the other model i was testing before this one a new material is created for each object with properties like color roughness and metalness to control how light interacts with it For the parts with textures, we adjust their encoding and orientation to ensure they render correctly. Once the materials are set, we calculate the model's bounding box to determine its size and center. This ensures the model is properly aligned within the scene. Finally, we add the model to the scene and hide the loading screen indicating that the 3D environment is ready to go. With the model in place, we'll move on to post-processing and further enhancements. First, we use a render pass to render the scene and the camera together. Think of it as the foundation for all the effects we'll layer on top. Next, we add the bloom pass which is crucial for creating the glowing effect in our scene. This pass enhances the brightness of the light sources giving them a realistic glow and adding depth to the overall look. The bloom effect uses settings like intensity, radius and threshold and I highly recommend experimenting with these values. Small tweaks can significantly impact how the exposure, glow and overall ambience of your scene turn out. I initially struggled with getting the lights to glow correctly. I spent hours tweaking settings and troubleshooting but nothing seemed to work. Finally, I came across this Reddit post that recommended using this specific post-processing library. It was a game changer and it completely transformed how the lights and glow effects looked in the scene. With this setup, the glow effects blend seamlessly into the environment, adding a futuristic and immersive vibe to the 3D scene. To enhance the overall visual experience, I decided to add an animated grain effect on top of the scene. This effect isn't essential for the 3D setup, so feel free to skip it if it's not something you want in your project. To achieve this, I used a small custom shader for the grain effect. I'll paste the shader here for reference. I actually asked ChatGPT to create this for me and it worked quite well. The shader introduces random noise to the scene which animates over time creating a film grain effect. Once the green effect was ready, I combined all the post-processing effects using a composer. The composer acts as the final pipeline where all rendering passes are layered and processed sequentially. First, the render pass draws the scene and camera. Next, the bloom pass adds the glow effects. And finally, the film green pass applies the animated green texture on top of everything. Next, we'll wrap things up with the animation loop and rendering process. To make transitions between movements smooth and natural, I used a function called LERP, which stands for linear interpolation. This function helps us gradually transition between two values over time. For example, it smoothly adjusts the camera's position from its current angle to the target angle and its side from the current Y position to the target Y position. Inside the animate function, the loop starts by calling itself using request animation frame, ensuring the animations are optimized for the browser's refresh rate. The time uniform of the film grain effect is updated to ensure the grain animation progresses smoothly. The camera's angle and vertical position are updated using LERP to create a fluid motion. The angle determines the circular path around the scene, while the vertical position adjusts the camera's height. The camera's position is recalculated based on the angle and radius, creating the parallax effect we set up earlier. Finally, the camera is instructed to look at the center of the scene, keeping the model in focus and the composer renders the scene with all the post-processing effects applied. 
This loop runs continuously, updating the scene in real time and making it interactive and dynamic. Let's call the animate function to start the render loop. Finally, we ensure the scene is responsive by adding a resize handler. This is important because without it, the scene might look distorted when the browser window is resized. The resize handler updates the camera's aspect ratio to match the new screen size, ensuring the perspective remains correct. We attach this handler to the resize event of the window. So it triggers automatically whenever the browser size changes. With the animation and resizing in place, the 3D experience is complete and ready to shine on any screen size. Hope you found the video helpful. See you in the next one.